All right, are we ready to get started? All right, so thank you everyone and welcome to our intellectual property consideration workshop this morning. We are so excited to have Adhira and Tony joining us from WISIS. Um, they will be sharing what WISIS is and their disclosure process, uh, the services they have to offer to Madison College students, and they will also be covering the fundamentals of intellectual property. So if you guys have any questions throughout uh, today's workshop, feel free to add it in the chat. Um, we'll all kind of be watching in there, as well as you can unmute yourself and ask um, that way as well. If you feel comfortable, please turn your cameras on. We like to see some faces of those who are with us today. And lastly, we will be recording today's session. So I will be sending that out um, later this afternoon if you would like to rewatch it or maybe send it to somebody else who would find it useful. So with that, I think we can go ahead and get started. Great, uh, thank you so much, Kelsey. And good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here today. Uh, Tony and I are very excited to present to uh, Madison College and we hope you find this workshop useful. So we're from WISIS. My name is Adira Sankara and I'm the Assistant Director of WISIS. And with me, I also have Tony Hansen, who's the Manager of IP and Licensing. And Tony will introduce himself in just a minute here. So you're probably wondering, what is WISIS? Uh, so WISIS is a nonprofit supporting organization for the UW system. And we serve as the designated technology management office for the 11 four-year comprehensive uh, campuses. <clears throat> so basically all of the UW campuses, not including UW-Madison and UW-Milwaukee. And our main goal is really to build a culture of innovation. And that's a culture of innovation that we want to build within our campuses, but also in our communities adjoining our campuses. Um, and as you'll hear from Tony and myself, you know, we kind of span the gamut of innovation all the way from the idea stage to how do you market and uh, a product that you might have developed. In addition to these 11 uh, campuses, uh, 11 UW comprehensive campuses that we serve, we established a formal partnership with Madison College uh, in January of 2016. And so we also provide technology management services to Madison College faculty, students, and staff. Uh, and the, our main point of con uh, contact here is Brian Woodhouse, uh, the VP of Corporate and Regional Affairs. So that's the person that uh, Tony will talk about, you know, when we're doing the invention disclosures, or if you have any ideas, that would be your uh, go-to person. So the wife of STEAM uh, team is, oops, sorry. Yeah, there we go. The WISIS team is comprised of uh, professionals and we have a, really a very diverse uh, set of backgrounds. We have people with backgrounds in IP, intellectual property, licensing. We've got lots of scientific experts on our team. We have business and entrepreneurship experts, grant administration, research development, a marketing team. Uh, we also do lots of events. And so we have an events and program coordinator and we work together to make sure that all our campuses receive you know, support for advancing our ideas and innovations. Next, please. So what does WISIS do? Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we kind of really support everything from the very early idea stages, right? So we fund research by connecting researchers to grants and supporting their grant applications, all the way to marketing the ideas that are coming out, whether that's through intellectual property assistance, whether that's through entrepreneurial support. Um, and along the way, we'd like to think that we inspire students um, and help them get a better educational experience through our events and a lot of the other panels that we, uh, that we conduct. And finally, we, our big goal is really to foster a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship on our, in our campuses and in our communities in Wisconsin. So with that, I will turn it over to Tony Hansen to talk a little bit more about how we market the ideas and how we manage innovations that are coming out of our communities. Tony. Thanks, Adira. Um, just to confirm everyone can hear me right now. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so what we'll go through in the you know, next few, well, more than a few, but the next slides is going to relate to intellectual property generally and then 
specifically, we'll start to get into a little bit about how one critically looks at their idea, their innovation, and works to determine its potential, both from a protection standpoint, but also from a commercialization standpoint. So in a way to think of this process overall is innovation management. And so the goal of this will be one to, to talk about intellectual property protection, specific, specifically focusing in on things like patents, copyrights, and trademarks. We'll, we'll touch a bit on sort of marketing and business outreach and what WISIS does on behalf of inventors and, and what you can consider yourself if you're gonna take this on as an entrepreneur. And then this idea of licensing and commercialization and kind of the roles that those play uh, for an individual, a tech transfer office, you know, whether you're partnering with a, an existing company or perhaps a new startup. So kicking things off first though, we're gonna move into intellectual property. So as a quick disclaimer, this presentation is intended to just briefly touch upon the basics of intellectual property. And so Adira and I are not attorneys, and so this is not meant to be taken as legal advice, just an overall overview and summary of information. So perhaps you're asking yourself, well, what is intellectual property? And often we shorten this to IP. And this is going to be any product of the human intellect that the law can protect from unauthorized use by others. And so ownership of intellectual property can inherently more or less create a government supported limited monopoly within that protected property. Because what it's really allowing for, and particularly with regards to patent rights, IP ownership is a negative right, not a positive one. So it's gonna be granting you, the owner of the intellectual property, the right to stop or preclude someone else from practicing your invention, your intellectual property. So why is IP important? Well, one, the ability to, once generated, protect it, can provide you with a lot of competitive advantages out there in the commercial marketplace. So the ability to protect it allows for the promotion of investment into research and development that companies might be engaging with or you know, individuals or, or research institutions might be engaging with. And if they start to build their intellectual property portfolio and have protection around that, the various types of IP that they've generated, well, that can build their reputation as an institution, as a company, or purely as an individual. And what it's going to also help really support is this prevention of theft and as well as consumer confusion. And that confusion aspect we'll get into a little bit later here. And ultimately, what it can really assist with is leveling the playing field. So if you think about all the major companies out there that, that already have a, you know, their position in a, in a market space, if you come up with something new and it's, it's groundbreaking and it has the ability to disrupt the market and you can get protection and preclude others from using it, that can really give you an advantage to compete with those major entities. So there are a lot of challenges when it comes to intellectual property protection. And so this is one of the benefits of say, working with a technology management office such as WISIS. So one, patents in, in particular, they're quite expensive to, to go after and, and get. So that's where an office like ours can come into play of paying for and assisting with, with that protection. Um, you know, but even going through that process sometimes what you pursue in the form of the patent may not ultimately be what the final product ends up looking like. Um, you just won't know because you're going through the prosecution and, and getting that patent protection. Meanwhile, while you're, you're engaging with continued development of your product. And then commercialization of products is really a game of numbers. So you can think about under 1% will ever earn over a million dollars uh, from, from that, that product that's been developed. And particularly what's beneficial with regards to tech transfer offices is that if we're able to be successful in commercializing the use of intellectual property, the revenue shared will come back to benefit the individuals, the inventors, as well as the university that they, they are connected to. And then of course, when it comes to enforceability and any future potential for litigation around intellectual property, um, that's also very costly. So having a tech transfer office on your side can be quite beneficial. 
So some of the types of IP, the main ones that we often think of when it comes to intellectual property and in protecting such, will have to do with one patents and specific, specifically utility patents. So this is gonna be around things like inventions and we'll focus on aspects such as composition of matter or what, what's made up within that invention, perhaps the method of use or the method of manufacturing or how it's created. Another big area will be copyrights. So this is going to be protecting things that have been authored. I've included here the logos of the uh, Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store because software code is something that is authored and can be protected through copyright. And then trademarks, which we're gonna be protecting things like names and logos and some other aspects. Um, so again, there's there's very iconic brand there, Coca-Cola and their logo. So we'll get into each of these specifically in the next slides. So of course, starting first with patents. And for this next section, this is gonna be focusing in on specifically the utility patent. So again, if we think about IP protection and then we focus in on patents here, the ability to get protection and preclude others creates a financial incentive for innovation and discovery. And you're having the set of exclusive rights granted by a sovereign state to you know, you, yourself as an inventor, whoever is the inventor, or an assignee for a limited period of time. So we talked about that limited monopoly aspect. And so a sovereign state will think of the United States of America, that that's who will be granting rights within the, this country um, when someone's going after patent protection. But in exchange for these rights, it's expected that in the patent itself, you'll be publicly disclosing this invention, right? The, the, how it's made up, how it's used, um, how, you, how you create it. Um, so that more or less, not always, but someone might be able to take a look at that patent, get a sense of the technology, the idea, the innovation, and they might be able to use that information once that those, you know, the patent has expired and they can themselves use that for their own commercial gain. So when you are granted the rights, though, to exclude others, a, a utility patent will last for 20 years from the initial date of filing. And on average, we say that the costs to get and maintain a patent can range anywhere from 15 to $30,000. And then to actually get an issued patent, uh, that can take anywhere from three to five years. So when you actually take a look at a patent, there's gonna be three main sections that you'll notice. One are gonna be the specifications, and this is sort of the body and provides some, some background information, maybe talks a bit about the problem that your invention is solving. There's gonna be the figures. Those will be supporting pieces that will help with sort of visualizing and seeing what is actually being made here or perhaps kind of have schematics of the process at times. And then the claims are going to be the most important part because these are really going to be the specific points that detail what your invention is. And claims can come in the form of independent claims uh, where they stand alone or dependent claims where they refer back to those independent claims. And again, what's discussed within these claims will be things like the composition or the method of doing or using uh, the invention. So when you actually apply for patent protection, it goes through what's called prosecution. And here in the United States, prosecution occurs at the United States Patent and Trademark Office or the USPTO. So when you apply, it will ultimately be looked at by an examiner at the USPTO. And they'll be taking a look at the patent as a whole, but you know, the, their, their main focus will really come down to the claims that you're, you, you've written into your application. And after they start to do their assessment of prior art, which you see there as the third bullet point, they may come back with rejection of some of your claims based on um, citing issues of novelty, meaning they think this isn't new, or it's, it's obvious, meaning that someone in the, in the field with a general understanding could have foreseen that, that this was an easy thing to progress to. Maybe you're combining a few things that are already out there and exist. So you might get some rejection of all or some of your claims based on those citations, but also if, if, if they look good to the examiner, um, 
they can allow the claims. And prosecution is usually going to be a back and forth process where you get office actions from the examiner and then it's upon you in partnership with either, you know, your attorneys to respond to those office actions. And you're working towards ultimately trying to get some rights granted to you in, in a final form um, through your patent application. So I mentioned this point about prior art, and we'll talk later on a little bit more about searching for prior art and the things to consider. But generally, what prior art is referring to is any evidence that your invention already exists. So keep that in mind. Okay, so that allows us to then move into trademarks. So getting or what a trademark protects is going to be anything that identifies or distinguishes one product or service from another. And the caveat here is that the trademark is going to have to be used in commerce. And really the benefit of trademarks is uh, for consumers. It allows us to recognize trusted brands, our products, things so that when we purchase or use something, we know that what we're purchasing or using is actually what we're intending to purchase or use. Uh, this also goes through prosecution, but a much shorter period of time traditionally, again, through the USPTO because it's the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And then you'll often see when it comes to things that are protected with tra trademark, they're either uh, identified with this TM or with the R and the circle around it. So TM indicates that you are claiming this as your trademark. But if you actually go through prosecution and it's granted to you, well, then you can switch things over to the registered uh, symbol there, the registered trademark. The interesting thing about trademarks is that so long as that they're continued to be used in commerce, they basically don't have an end to their lifespan. But the interesting caveat is that they can be ruled invalid through extensive use. So if your trademark becomes basically synonymous with a product, um, you can lose your trademark because of that extensive use. So uh, an example of this uh, is trampoline. That was actually the brand that this company was trying to create. And it was more the, the item itself, the, the thing that we all know and bounce on, had bounced on is uh, it's, it's more technical name was the rebound tumbler, but no one called it that. Everyone referred to it as trampoline. So that trademark was ruled invalid over time through extensive use. And there's other ex examples that, you know, I'm sure it's a few that you can even think of that have occurred over time, some famous ones. And ultimately this is arguably considered one of the most valuable types of intellectual property, because when we think about a patent, well, there's, there's a duration on that, there's 20 years. So at a certain point, you're going to lose those exclusive rights and other people will be able to, to practice the use of the intellectual property um, without you granting them those rights. But again, as long as you continue to use your trademark in commerce, uh, it will remain yours and yours exclusively short of this um, extensive use caveat. So what can be protected with trademark? Well, some common instances are things like names. So you can think of Nike. Nike has a slogan, just do it. And then they have their logo, the, the swoosh. Some other uncommon ones could be things like 3D shapes. So you see there the Toblerone candy bar. Um, colors can be protected. So that one, if it, maybe it's a little tough to see, but that's the Boise State University uh, football field. And so they've gone after trademark protection for actually all colored, non-green colored football fields, but specifically the one that they use is, is blue. Uh, sounds can be trademarked, so NBC has their chimes, and then believe it or not, smells, so, so Play-Doh has a trademark on their smell. That takes us then into copyrights. So a copyright is going to be a national legal right granting the creator of an original work exclusive rights for the use and distribution and enabling that creator to receive compensation for their intellectual effort. So copyright is going to be protecting things like literary works, so books, musical works, songs, um, pictures, graphics, art, sculptures, you know, also motion pictures and audiovisual works, sound recordings, architectural works. And then to just note that copyright is also protecting the digital versions of each of these uh, things as well. So copyrights are automatic. So the second that you've authored something, you actually have copyright protection uh, around it, but you can also go through the process of registering your copyright 
Um, and you do that with the US Copyright Office um, housed in the Library of Congress. And so to keep in mind that copyright protection is not covering the material itself, just the form of expression. So literally what you're seeing or hearing is being protected, not so much the, the, the themes per se, or like the story within it. Um, it's, you know, words on paper more or less, or, or um, what you're, you're, you're visually seeing. And so when it's written um, out to indicate that something has been protected um, with copyright or you're claiming copyright, you, you're probably familiar with that little C and the circle around it. The year is then listed in which um, it was registered or created. Um, and then who, who claims ownership of that? So for example, here I put Weiss's Technology Foundation. So I talked about registering your copyright. So a, a benefit to doing so is that if there's ever question or litigation that comes as a result of copyright dispute, um, if you hadn't registered and you didn't mark it, you could be looking at reduced or no damages. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you might consider going after and registering um, your copyright um, specifically. Copyrights will last for seven years after the death of the author. And this doesn't go through a prosecution process, um, whereas trademarks and patents do. Okay, so some other types of less common intellectual property and ways to protect them, uh, design patents. So these are gonna be protecting specifically ornamental characteristics of a product. So think shape or proportions, surface ornamentation, or perhaps a combination of the two. This still needs to be novel. And then what you're protecting with regard to the shape or the proportions, it can't relate back to function of, of the device itself. Um, this is a lot more uh, fast to generally obtain protection around, usually within a year, compared to, again, those utility patents where we're looking more at a three to five year period. Uh, design patents will have a life of 15 years. And these are only going to have one claim, whereas utility patents will have multiple claims. And then if you take a look at the right here, the image, uh, these are some design, some figures from design patents that Dyson filed for um, those, those unique fans that they manufacture. And then the thing to note in these figures is that when you see the broken lines, those are purely there for illustrative purposes. In those specific filings, anything with a broken line is not to be considered within that one claim that's being um, filed as part of that design patent application. So you can get patent protection around plants. So plant patents uh, protect plants that reproduce asexually. They, again, still have to be novel and non-obvious. Those hurdles have to be overcome. And then the plant has to have distinguishing characteristics from related plants, and these will last for 20 years. There's also plant variety protection. This is going to be protecting plants that reproduce sexually or through tuber propagated plant varieties. Still must be novel and distinct. Um, the variety must be uniform and it must be a stable plant that you know can grow multiple times over and this will last more so approximately for 25 years um, i've included on the right here uh, the the knockout rose because this is a very popular plant here in wisconsin because it's a breed of rose that was created to be very disease resistant um, very resistant to the cold temperatures that we see uh, and the inventor actually lives in the milwaukee area one other type to consider is trade dress, and this falls sort of under the umbrella of trademarks. So trade dress will be protecting overall commercial images of a product or perhaps its packaging. Again, this must be used in a commercial setting and it can't relate back to function and it must be distinctive. So distinctiveness can either be inherent to the packaging or perhaps through secondary meaning, which uh, means that association goes back to the source producer. Some limitations here are that trade dress can't be around method or a method or style of doing business. Uh, that's not protectable. And you can also get um, trade dress protection around marketing themes or a marketing approach that that's not protectable. Um, so these are again gonna be for the benefit of the consumer. This again goes through the USPTO and may require prosecution as you look for trade dress protection. So the average timeline to, to you have this granted can generally fall in the 12 to 18 uh, month period. 
But this is going to have um, some differences, perhaps, to a design patent because it's going to be more broad. It's going to have a longer life. So if you recall, our design patents for 15 years, um, this will, again, kind of continue for the life of, of the product so long as it's used commercially. And again, it does have that commercial requirement like the trademarks we've discussed below. And then one other type to touch on is trade secrets and, and filing for trade secret protection. So this is basically something that's been developed that generally is not known by the public. You've kept this confidential, you haven't published on it, you haven't talked about it publicly, and you also are taking steps to rigorously defend um, that those secrets more or less, and, and so you can maintain this protection. Uh, so if it is though discovered either independently um, or somehow the information is released or reverse engineered by another party um, or company, somehow just otherwise becomes known through non-nefarious means, um, you can lose your rights to, to trade secret. Um, so, you know, if, if there is misappropriation, it's an inquired view of improper means, you can, you know, pursue legal action and, and results um, of that. And these can potentially work hand in hand with patents because there maybe can be some aspect that's kept back a little bit and, and you maintain that as um, some as a trade secret, whereas other aspects of your business, you know, you, you it's a little more obvious, you might pursue that portion of it with patent protection. Um, but again, patents do require publication of the technology, whereas trade secrets, you're keeping that confidential. Um, so I've listed there in the upper right corner, if perhaps you're interested, but an example um, actually comes out of the University of Wisconsin Platteville, um, a, a faculty member there developed um, what's called first contact polymer. And this is a polymer that um, he created to have a very, very low um, adhesive quality. It's, it's, it comes in the liquid form. It can be painted onto surfaces. It dries and then can be peeled away. Um, and it's, it's so much gentler than even say scotch tape. Um, so it, it can be used to remove say uh, lint or debris or other um, particulate from say really sensitive surfaces such as the lenses of, of expensive equipment like microscopes or telescopes or things like that. So that is um, the recipe for that has been has been kept as a trade secret. Okay, and then I will just briefly touch on software IP protection. So you can certainly, as I mentioned, register copyright around software source code or the natural uh, language version of the software. So we're not talking the executable code, but the actual source code. Um, but a person or a company can also pursue protection um, through for utility patent, um, you know, covering more so the processes that are embodied within the software program itself. The other thing that you can do with regard to software is go after design patent protection. Say if you have, you know, kind of a unique look to your user interface and you want to protect that for a period of time. And that's something Apple has done with a lot of their user interfaces for their operating systems. So a few things though to consider with regard to software IP protection. One, you're gonna consider sort of where is the value derived from your software? You know, is it in the novel function that the software performs or how it works or is it the code itself? Um, you know, will it be enforceable and how easily will you be able to detect if someone is practicing your process within their code? Um, what is the life of, of your software? So if this is something that's maybe gonna be really beneficial now or for a few years, but in five years time, you, you anticipate that there will be a lot of advances or things will have changed and won't have as much of a use at that point. So that's really then weighing kind of the benefits of, of the time that, you know, you, or the life of your software versus the time it takes to get a patent granted to you. And do other barriers of entry to exist that maybe may dissuade you from pursuing patent protection around your uh, software, such as, you know, it would be cheaper for someone to actually just buy our software than for them to go and try and create their own version that sort of replicates or has a similar end result to what we're doing. Um, so if that's the case, they might just want to purchase or license from you. And then ultimately, the one that's really sticky here is can your software actually be claimed? 
And I'm not going to get into the specifics here because it's it's really shifted quite a bit in recent years with some changes to the law. Um, but if software has sort of uh, the process deals with abstract ideas or mathematical models or other aspects, it can be hard to get patent protection around that. So if it's, so, if it's something you're considering, um, I would recommend talking to an attorney who has a lot of experience going after software patent protection because it, it's it's tough to navigate. Okay, so this is kind of a, a breather point in the information that we've given you so far. Um, so if anyone wants to participate here, we've thrown up a Coca-Cola bottle. Are there any types of intellectual property that you see as part of this Coca-Cola bottle? And maybe how would you go after getting protection around that IP? Feel free to unmute, chime in. No takers. <laughs> okay, well, maybe you're looking at it, maybe you're thinking of some things and you're just not comfortable sharing and that's fine. So some of the things you might have thought of though, um, perhaps going after a utility patent, if you think about that cap. Um, so it's got that tamper resistant function and that sort of indicates to it has a use um, that, you know, as you open the soda, you can be generally confident no one has been in that soda before because you're actually breaking, you know, that cap, the seal there. Um, perhaps design patent could be pursued around the shape of the bottle. Um, Coca-Cola is, is very famous for their recipe and, and keeping that as a trade secret. They've got their name and their logo, which can be protected via a trademark. And then generally around, you know, the packaging and the labels, you could look at pursuing trade dress protection. Um, just want to make sure there's no chat so far. I think we're good. So I'll keep advancing on. Sorry, go ahead. I have a question on the previous slide you had. But, you know, you mentioned that Play-Doh, you know, can patent their smell. Can yeah. It, can taste be a patent for Coke? For some reason, you're, I'm having, you're really quiet on my end, so I can't, I don't know why you're quiet. <laughs> uh, I, I guess what I was asking was, Play-Doh, uh, you mentioned, has... Uh, the trademark for the smell. Right, yeah. yeah. Can, can Coke do that for its taste? I don't know if taste can be trademarked. Um, that's an interesting question, something we'd have to look into a little bit more. Um, certainly, the, you know, the, the, that taste comes from its secret recipe, so at least they're protecting in some form there with the trade secret. Okay, so we're moving on. We're about halfway, a little over halfway through our time, and we're going to move into this innovation management process. So this is the process that Wysis works through with our inventors or innovators, those, those that come to work with us. But regardless of whether you're, you're working through Madison College and thus through WISIS, or you're doing this you know, independently as an entrepreneur, I think this is a really nice process to, to, to refer back to and think about as you analyze and determine the commercial viability of your idea or your product. So we'll kind of go through some of the important points here. And ultimately, what usually comes to us in the first instance in an official manner is an invention disclosure. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's kind of someone telling us about their idea. And then we go through an assessment process. So if you recall back to that concept, I was talking about prior art with regard to the prosecution of patents. So prior art, again, re recall, is any evidence that your idea, your, your innovation, your invention already exists. So how can someone know potentially if somewhere, some anywhere in the world has already kind of come up with or created what they're thinking about or working on? Well, you do a prior art search and you, you just kind of do your best here. So you want to think about, based on your idea, what are the, some of the key words that characterize or define what I'm working on? And then you use those keywords to start searching. So you can do just general broad searching in Google. And I literally mean in the search engine, Google, you can start typing these things in as they relate to your idea, um, you know, as, as few or as many words as needed to sort of start 
getting some results and seeing if there's any hits that tend to align with what you're thinking about, because that's a great place to start because it's a very powerful search engine. Uh, you can go more specifically though into patent searching. So you can go to the USPTO's website and they will have every patent that has been applied for and, and or granted in the United States from the beginning. And you can search all of those and try to determine what's come before that is similar to what I'm thinking about now. That's a complicated search though at times. Um, one, because there's so much there. And two, because what you're actually gonna be what's going to be sent back to you are going to be patents and the language in patents at times can be a little bit confusing. Um, so it's not always clear if what you're looking at fully relates to what you're thinking about. Um, and then the actual searching can use Boolean searching tombs. So it can be a little bit cumbersome. So actually Google again has, has a patent search engine and that one's a little more forgiving in terms of actually pulling up the patents. But again, you're still, you know, on, on the hook to kind of take a look at them and, and analyze them, you know, as you as they return back to you. But then it's not just if, if prior art comes from the United States, it's anywhere. So you might consider searching some of the foreign patent offices too. Google will return foreign patents. Um, so that that's another good reason to, to start there or work through that search engine. Um, and then again, some of the foreign patents though will be in foreign languages. So you might not be able to determine exactly what, what they're being, what's being spoken to there. The other big area is journal searching, depending on what you're working on. So using again, Google Scholar, that's a great place to, to get sent back a lot of publications. So again, the, the idea is prior art because it's any evidence. So it doesn't necessarily have to have a patent applied for it. It doesn't have to have been published on. Someone could have just manufactured it and started selling it and decided I'm gonna be the first to market. So again, that broad searching can be beneficial. So then determining you know, your position with regard to the IP position and how novel or non-obvious your idea is kind of falls within that prior art search. But there's also, if you think you can go get protection, that's great but will anyone actually want to, to use the intellectual property that I've developed either in the form of they wanna incorporate it into their processes or they wanna buy my product. So you wanna start thinking about market potential, thinking about the applications that your innovation might have. So what are your key selling points, the advantages and the benefits? What are the trends of that market? Is this something that's still hot? There's, there's a, a, a really large growth rate still. Um, it, it's not sort of just kind of trickling on or you know actually decreasing over time um, and then add to that the overall market size because maybe this would be groundbreaking and, and change a, a specific market tremendously but there's really only a, a handful of individuals or companies that that kind of operate in that space so it, it would be hard for you to maybe compete with them so considering the overall size of your market um, and then thinking about those key companies that are already in that space, who will you have to compete with or maybe partner with if your technology um, makes sense to be incorporated into their product offerings or their portfolio or processes. So really just getting an overall sense of the path to market for your idea or innovation. So where you might get some of this information, well, there's market reports. Um, full market reports are often available through university libraries. So I'm not sure if Madison College makes those available. So that's something you might want to um, look into at your institution. Um, local small business development centers can sometimes be able to assist with provide some of that information. Um, but oftentimes what you can find online are at least report summaries. And there's a lot of different set search platforms that can return at least report summaries to you and can give you just a general broad sense of the, of the market. Um, a really beneficial one, I think, though, is going to markets and markets. Their report summaries are actually quite detailed and can provide a lot of information um, because actually purchasing these reports usually runs to the tune of a few thousand dollars. So that's not something that anyone just, you know, buys lightly. Uh, so you really have to to kind of justify that you need this information to make your product successful. So for the, the average entrepreneur, that's gonna be a, a very expensive item to consider. So at least getting a broad sense from some of those summaries can be helpful. 
Other resources you can work towards are government reports. You know, if your product is going to fall somewhere that the EPA or the USDA maybe has generated reports around, um, searching through those can provide some value and valuable insight and information. Sometimes companies that are, fall into this market space, they, they create white papers um, that you can read, or they specifically talk to their development needs on their website, and that can help guide you in your development of your idea or product. And of course, just general news articles might provide insights into the overall market space. So then finally, you're thinking about your stage of development. So starting at sort of a proof of concept, but then advancing on to a functional prototype and then finishing up with a commercial product, knowing that there's going to be different iterations that come through at each point of these different steps. So resources to help with prototype development, well, that can be your institution. Um, so maybe there's a design course that you can um, look to partner with or have your project worked on. Same with capstone projects. Um, I know there's design courses at Madison College that, that work on products that are presented to them either internally from the students or they might talk to a company. If it's software you're thinking about and specifically mobile applications, UW-Milwaukee has the app brewery, UW-Parkside has the app factory, they can help with development there. Your SBDC can connect you to local industry contacts. And then also considering if you need um, funding resources, grants could be a great place, whether they be federal, non-federal, or industry. And then agreements just to hit you know, things you might come into play as you go through this process, as you're creating your company or as you're developing your product could be a confidential disclosure agreement or CDA, sometimes thought of also as NDA, a non-disclosure um, agreement. Um, whether If you're bringing in people to work for you and you're hiring them as employees, you know, are you establishing with them a work for hire agreement? Agreements you might get go into with suppliers or distributors or manufacturers. If you're going to license this out to a company to use your intellectual property, these are all things that you might come across in time. These can be complicated legal documents with a lot of important terms within them. So it's really beneficial here to hire an attorney to support you if you do get to the point where you're navigating through any of these types of agreements. So my last um, slide here, um, or slides before I turn it over back to Adira, is this idea of disclosing an invention. Um, so as, as a partner with Madison College, WISIS has received disclosure, disclosures um, from Madison College students and faculty. And what's being conveyed in a disclosure is one, who you are as the inventor and when was the idea conceived? Um, was there any funding that went into the development of that idea or that product? Any agreements executed? That's important to know because funding or agreements can often have uh, language within them that speak to intellectual property ownership and what you can do with the intellectual property. The disclosure tells us about the stage of development and if further development is needed. Um, you know, you're going to let us know a little bit about some of the commercial applications or who you see using this. What's that main target market? What's the competition or the existing solutions that are that is or are, are already out there? And have you basically publicly disclose this or, or talked about this with anyone previously. That's the information you put into a disclosure form that comes to WISIS. So specifically disclosing at Madison College, one, I would recommend that you access the Madison College Intellectual um, Policy Guidelines and Procedures document. Um, so that's available through your website. I've taken a look at that. Um, in that document, it speaks to ownership of IP will be determined um, through, you know, potential use of campus administered funds or campus resources or campus facilities. So to go through the full assessment process, the best way of kind of seeing where your idea stands with regards to ownership and your ability to engage with WISIS or, you know, through Madison College is to complete that invention disclosure form. And that's Appendix A in that IP guideline, IP um, policy guidelines and procedures document. And that gets sent to Brian Woodhouse so that his email is there, woodhouse at madisoncollege.edu. And that's laid out in that procedures document as well. Um, so if you have any questions, you can certainly you know, contact us, but Brian Woodhouse will also be a great point of contact if you're thinking about you know, getting more into this innovation process and, and disclosing your idea for assessment. So with that, I'll turn it back to Adira 
um, to kind of get back into the entrepreneurship side of things. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, I thought that was, you know, I, I've heard you present this IP uh, presentation a couple of times now, and honestly, I learn something new every time we watch it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> As Tony said, you know, this is this is sort of the beginning stages, right? You've got your idea, you're evaluating it, you're trying to think about, well, is there is there any IP protection around it? Maybe you disclose to YSIS, maybe you've gone through the process and we say, hey, you know, there might be something here, right? And you you file a patent or you you know worked on a prototype or a proof of concept of your idea. Um, and so what next? Right. So I want to talk a little bit about what are the uh, what are the different ways we can um, help you if you're interested in moving the company or you're moving your idea forward as an entrepreneur. Um, so, Tony, if you could go back one slide. Um, so with that in mind, what we created is a new program. Well, it's almost two years old now. It feels new because of the pandemic uh, and everything being so slow. But the White Sis Venture Home program. Uh, was created almost two years ago now. And the goal really is to serve our community of entrepreneurs in Wisconsin. So this, I wanna make this distinction a little bit clearer because while YSIS's technology management and uh, you know, services are limited to our UW campuses, faculty staff, as well as, as you uh, now heard, Madison College faculty, staff, and students, the Venture Home Program is a community-facing organization. And that means that anybody in Wisconsin has uh, the opportunity to access the resources we're providing. And the goal really is to provide everything your startup needs under one roof. And that might seem like a very, very lofty uh, and ambitious uh, goal, but the way we, uh, next please, but the way we want to accomplish this is uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Tony. The way we want to ac accomplish this mission is to facilitate scalable startups by providing local access to a statewide network of resources. Now, being in Madison, you know, there's already a very thriving entrepreneurial community, but there are a lot of other resources and technical expertise that's that's um, present throughout the state. And there's lots of statewide resources like the Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic, We've got mentor networks, we have entrepreneur networks, and the goal of Venture Home really is to provide sort of the webbing that connects all of these different activities that are happening across the state, including in Madison. Um, so some of the, you know, some of the services that we provide are uh, like a more concierge style access to the resources that your startup might need. You know, one, one of the things that has been very interesting in the last two years is Yes, we get lots of ideas that people want to patent and ideas that they want to form companies around, but we also get a lot of entrepreneurs who say, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't have a technical background, right? I don't know, I don't have my own idea. I don't have something that I think can be patented. Then we say, okay, well, guess what? There are a lot of patents that are just sitting on the shelf uh, within Weiss's portfolio, within WARF, which is the technology transfer office for UW-Madison and um, UW-Milwaukee Research Foundation's portfolio, right? So we've got thousands of technologies that are just kind of sitting there waiting for someone to commercialize it. And at least some of those are going to be good for a startup. Um, so part of our resources is also connecting people to technology, connecting entrepreneurs to other entrepreneurs, connecting entrepreneurs to me uh, mentors, connecting you to the resources you need, basically. Um, next, please. So what do we do? So let's first think about your idea, right? As Tony kind of mentioned, you've got this idea and there's the IP considerations, but there's also market considerations, right? Um, this is a good example. This is actually from a guy who uh, has an Instagram account and maybe other social media too, but he calls it unnecessary inventions, right? So he's created this drone, enabled umbrella, right? So that you have two hands, one for your coffee and one for your phone, and you've got the umbrella hovering over you. Uh, is this patentable? Maybe, I mean, I haven't done the prior art search for it, but po quite possibly this is something that he could get a patent on. Now, should he get a patent on it? So let's, let's kind of walk through how do you evaluate your idea, right? So the first thing 
with customer discovery. You try to figure out who is going to be, uh, who has the problem, what the problem is, and why is it worth solving, right? So who has the problem? I, I have that problem. I'm often, you know, walking around with a phone in one hand and a coffee in the other hand, and if it rains, I'm kind of you know, out of luck here. Um, so I do have that problem, and I'm sure a lot of other people do too. Um, why is the problem worth solving? Well, you know, I can't put down my phone, right? I mean, I can't be outside and not be looking at my phone every minute. So probably a problem worth solving. Next, please. Um, ne next, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the next piece comes in, which is the problem solution fit. Does this, pro does this uh, product that this, this uh, clever man has created solve the problem? Yeah, it does. You're able to do what you need to do and still not get wet in the rain. Next, please. And this is where it gets tricky. And this is actually where most startups fail is you might identify a problem. You might even have a great solution for it. Will somebody pay for it? And that's the product market fit. And you can get that through a customer discovery process as well to say, okay, well, I'm solving a problem for you. Are you willing to pay, you know, $250 for, for this product? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I probably wouldn't pay that much for, for this. I would, I would just buy a hoodie, right? And so it's trying to think about what are the other solutions that also solve the problem? Trying to think about, you know, what does the market look like currently? What does the competition look like? And Tony kind of mentioned that market for quotes. That's a good one to look at for some of the more serious problems that you might be trying to solve is to see, well, how big is the market size for the problem you're solving? And what is the average cost of the current solution? Is your solution really that much better than the current solution that people will either buy more of or pay more for? Um, so those are some of the, just some of the things to keep in mind as you think about being an entrepreneur or taking your idea to market. Next, please. Okay, so kind of tying back to what Tony was talking about from an entrepreneur's perspective, why do you need to, uh, you know, protect your idea? Why pay uh, all of this money to patent your idea? Or why work with a technology transfer office to patent your idea if you're going to be, you know, the entrepreneur and you're going to kind of sell your own product, right? Well, for one thing, it does generate value for your startup. So a lot of you have probably heard of, you know, all of these big companies having a valuation. And part of what goes into valuation of a company is um, its IP portfolio, right? I mean, especially with some of the bigger companies have tens and hundreds of thousands of patents and copyrights filed under their company. And all of that has value. So when the company, when you think about the exit piece of this presentation, right? You need, what do you do with this idea? How do you bring it into a company? One of the common exit strategies is to get acquired or to get investment from venture capital or from anyone. And having IP in your portfolio increases the valuation of your company. It also protects your solution, right? If you really have come up with a novel solution, it stops other people, if done correctly, <laughs> and enforce correctly, it can stop other people and deter other people from entering the market. It gives you the time and the space that you need to really work on your product and to get it out into the market, make tweaks and make sure you find that correct product market fit. And then, if, you know, if you think about the copyright piece of it, it creates your, uh, creates your brand. So all of these pieces that Tony's talked about really add a lot of value to your company. Next. Um, and I, I like to use this quote by Teddy Roosevelt for our entrepreneurs, it's do what you can with what you have where you are. And I think this really ties in with this idea of protecting what you currently have, right? Because you can only do what you have resources to do, but you can protect the idea so that as you gain more resources, more investment, more funding for creating the next prototype or your full product launch, it gives you the time and space to be able to do those things. Next, please. Okay, um, so kind of to tie this all together, you know, as we've talked about, one way to move your idea to market is to license the technology. Uh, 
And that's something that, you know, uh, Wang has a lot of expertise with. He say, I, I'm just the idea person, right? I've got the idea, you know, I'm the engineer, I've created the product. I have no interest in creating a startup or a company. Or a Great. Guess what? There are other companies who might be interested in your technology and in your idea. So you can license these technologies to other companies. Um, you know, if you do end up creating your company, you can get acquired. And this is where my previous point about creating value for your company is important. Uh, or you can go public if you go really big and are able to get to that point and be uh, widely successful, which we hope all of you will be. Or you can stay private. Next, please. Um, but this is important. Do not block the exit. <laughs> so whatever your exit strategy is, it's important to keep an open mind. It's important to look through what are the options? What does the market look like? What is the other IP uh, landscape in the um, um, in your area? So, thank you. And yeah, this is you know this is sort of what we uh, what we say at uh, Weiss is that it's Eureka isn't a moment; it's a process, and we're here to help you with that process. So, any questions? Yeah, and the uh, before we get to questions, just in a minute, we've got a, you know, that, that material on intellectual property and patents, it's, it's a little dry, um, but we don't need to have, unless people want to shout out their guests is here, but we can give you a second to think about some of these and then um, kind of reveal what these actually are. But believe it or not, patent, patents can be fun too. Um, so what follows are some uh, technologies that were granted patents, uh, but their usefulness, because there, there has to be actually a, a use requirement um, when, when filing for a patent, but the commercial value of that usefulness is not for the USPTO to decide. Um, so kind of as, as, a, as Adira was just speaking to, um, that's, that's more for you to decide as the person trying to take it to market. Um, but more or less, th these were some things that have been protection, but you, know, you can kind of think about their usefulness yourself. Um, so this is one of them. So if anyone wants to unmute and kind of shout out what they think this is, um, you're more than willing. I know we got a couple minutes here before 11. So this one is not a back scratcher. We often get that guess. This is actually a pat yourself on the back device. Then we've got this one. This one, um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's actually a some sort of carnival game of kicking yourself in the rear. Um, and according to, I think, our IP and contracts associate, he mentioned that this isn't the only patent pursued around this type of device. So um, that, that was interesting. Uh, this one, uh, Maybe a little bit sad, but hey, still useful perhaps is the one person seesaw. So this has sort of a little uh, piston there or, or thing that can compress up and down as the individual seesaws by themselves. Um, maybe the pre-drone version of Adira's uh, example. This is the um, sun-filled helium shade. Um, so in this case, you had to just rely on helium in a, like a mylar balloon, I think, type setting to tuck under your armpits and float above you so your hands were free to go about your business. Um, this one is actually an odor alarm, and it's a little uh, it switched where it's not alerting you necessarily to an odor, it's alerting you with an odor. So this was, I think, developed out of Japan, and it is meant to detect like um, if a fire alarm, I think, is going off, and if you're perhaps um, you know hard of hearing or seeing the, the the loud sound or the flashing lights, this is meant to emit aerosolized wasabi that will then alert you and your olfactory senses to to this danger nearby. Um, and this one uh, often. People guess is, is maracas, but this is actually um, a ropeless jump rope. Um, so this is uh, if you've got really low ceilings in your gym, I guess you can you can use this device instead. Um, so we'll stop there because it it's 11. Um, any questions from anyone in the uh, virtual room here? Otherwise, I'll throw up here 
um, our contact information. Thank you. I love those examples at the end. Those are pretty funny. <laughs> um, so I just looking at the chat here, I will be sending out a recording of this later today. I'm going to also include um, Edira and Tony's contact information, just so if you would like to contact them, you can always contact the Center for Entrepreneurship at Madison College. We can always connect you to uh, those folks at WISES. And then um, with the policy guidelines and procedure documents too, we can always um, include that in the email and, or reach out to us at any time and we can get you those um, details. So thank you for joining us. Um, it was great to have the two of you. There was so much information shared in this hour. So again, I will be sending the recording out because I know there was so much information shared that you might want to rewatch it again. Um, but thank you. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, we will end this session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Maria, do you have a question? No, no, really, no, really. Okay. <laughs> I will see the, I will watch the, the record. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you for joining us. Okay, bye.